major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening. It's Tuesday, January 18th. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Trash started being picked up again today in Chula Vista and other communities served by Republic Services after a month-long strike. KPBS reporter Kitty Alvarado tells us while employees are happy to be back at work with a new contract, their customers are still unhappy. Enrique Martinez, a sanitation worker with Republic Services, is back at work in Chula Vista after being on strike for a month. I'm just happy to be, out, be back at work and be blessed that I have a job that provides food for my family. Trash piled up in Chula Vista and San Diego neighborhoods as the strike dragged on. Things got so bad, the city of Chula Vista even declared a local emergency. I'm happy to see him back. And many, like the owner of Skyline Convenience, were so desperate to get rid of trash, they paid hundreds of dollars to private companies to haul it away. The whole area stinks, and, and this is a nice, clean area, you know, so we don't want to... And it's bad for business, too. Republic Services and Local 542, the union that represents Martinez and over 250 of his co-workers, came to an agreement late Monday afternoon after being at a stalemate. As part of their new contract, employees will receive $1,000 bonuses, but no back pay. Money, Donnie Castillo says, is not a luxury as they went through the holidays, earning only a small portion of their salaries. It was a necessary sacrifice. I think a lot of my brothers... Uh, uh, understood, my co-workers understood that sacrifice. Republic Services said in a statement they welcomed their employees back and thanked their customers for their patience. But many customers aren't happy and want to be reimbursed, not just for the month they went without trash collection, but for having to hire help to haul it away. Folks have suffered and uh, and they're angry. Chula Vista Council Member Jill Galvez says she's fighting for that reimbursement for residents and for the city. It's not been cheap, and, and we will be billing Republic Services back for every dollar that we spend collecting all this um, supplemental trash. And we will also be fining and penalizing Republic. Sanitation workers set up a GoFundMe account to help support their families. But since one of their co-workers suffered a heart attack during the strike that put him in a coma, they decided to give that money to him. Galvez asks the community to come together and help support this worker. I hope, you know, folks that have a heart that want to do something to help and say thank you. Castillo also hopes the community now sees them in a new light after the strike. I'm hoping that the community sees what it is that we do. We do it with pride. They don't just see us as a stinky trash truck coming through the neighborhood, um, that they see the, the human part of it, the people that are inside. Kitty Alvarado, KPBS News. As COVID-19 cases continue to rise in many parts of the country, the Omicron variant now accounts for nearly all of the infections. The CDC says it has caused 99.5% of the new cases in the last week. At the beginning of December, it accounted for less than 1% of cases, but jumped to 89% by the end of the month. With this rapidly spreading variant, there's a debate over whether school doors stay open no matter what or if virtual learning is best right now. Reporter Gerald Ford just has the latest. COVID-19 continues to take its toll nationwide. According to data from Johns Hopkins University, the U.S. is currently averaging over 685,000 new cases per day. For some states, like New York, new cases have begun to slow down. But some health experts say we're not in the clear just yet. I can't stress enough, we have to stop the happy talk about Omicron. This is still a very serious pathogen. The pandemic continues impacting schools nationwide. Due to positive COVID cases, some districts, like Olathe in Kansas, have canceled classes so far this week. It's a very tricky time right now in our community because the spread is so high. 
A new review of studies released by the Journal of the American Medical Association shows school closures and social lockdown during the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic were associated with adverse mental health symptoms like distress and anxiety among children and adolescents. But some teachers have concerns about their own health, complicating the decision to return to in-person learning. I know teachers want to be in school, but they want to be in school where it's safe and healthy. Some state and local officials are doing what they can in hopes of keeping schools open. In Massachusetts, the governor announced a rollout of free at-home tests for teachers and students. Schools have a choice. They can choose to opt into this new rapid program as an alternative to the test and stay program, or they can stay with the program that's been operating over the course of the past year. Daryl Forges, KPBS News. And the government website for free COVID tests is up and running a day early. COVIDtest.gov officially launches tomorrow, but it went live today to make sure there aren't technical problems. Coming up on Evening Edition, how it works and the other ways you can get free tests. Today, telecom giants AT&T and Verizon agreed to limit their rollout of 5G cellular service in response to concerns it could be a danger to air travel to air travel in San Diego and the U.S. KPBS science and technology reporter Thomas Fudge has more. 5G technology will allow smartphones and other wireless devices to communicate a lot faster. And engineering professor Sajid Day at UC San Diego calls 5G efficient and essential. It will totally revolutionize uh, agriculture, industry, shipping, transportation, health. Everything. But this communications revolution has got a problem. Its wireless spectrum is uncomfortably close to that of the radar that airplanes use to land in low visibility conditions. In response, the airline industry has said airports need to maintain buffer zones such that 5G towers cannot operate within two miles of an airfield. It's a solution Professor Day calls drastic. And an FAA list of airports that have an adequate 5G buffer zone does not not include the San Diego International Airport. San Diego International put out a statement saying companies operating at the airport have not implemented 5G and those companies have agreed to work with the FAA to ensure continued operations at affected airports. For its part, AT&T said in a statement it has voluntarily agreed not to activate some towers near airport runways in the U.S. It added a jab at the FAA, saying the agency has not responsibly used the two years it has had to plan for this deployment. Day says he agrees the parties saw this coming and should have worked out a plan. He says one possible short-term solution, and it's not a good one for all airports, is to dial down the 5G as airplanes approach. Sensing technologies which can sense that our aircraft is coming and then the power can be reduced. Long term? It's more difficult to say, but a solution is needed if air travel and the power and the speed of 5G are going to coexist in urban America. Thomas Fudge, KPBS News. There is new hope and opportunity for California college students struggling to pay for their education. KPBS education reporter MG Perez has more on the program launched today that includes two San Diego universities. Californians for All College Corps is historic and a familiar idea. Young people doing service work in their communities and earning as much as $10,000 to pay for their higher education. Students received details on social media this morning as state leaders launched the debt-free pathway of hope and opportunity. We must call on young people to serve their community and then give them the opportunities to actually do so in a meaningful way. And we must do this while keeping them on track to graduate, building their skills, and helping make college more affordable. The online event included the announcement of 45 colleges and universities that will partner with the state in providing support to their students who qualify to join the College Corps. The University of San Diego and UC San Diego made the cut. Starting this fall, students on those campuses can apply for a year of service that could include climate action, tutoring, supporting food banks, and other community leads. Students on Pell Grants could use the $10,000 to pay their half of the remaining financial cost of tuition instead of borrowing it. California is and always should be 
a place where education turns dreams into reality, where people from all backgrounds and walks of life can succeed. That includes the so-called dreamers brought to the U.S. as very young children by their undocumented parents. Unlike the federally funded AmeriCorps volunteer organization, California's College Corps will accept eligible dreamers into state service for the first time. Service opportunities can be tailor-made to a student's talent or interest, like Ian Chavez, a junior at San Jose State, who spoke online this morning about the volunteer work he did Monday for the MLK holiday. We joined with Operation Sock Monkey to make sock monkeys with personal touches. And I'm not the best at sewing, but I hope they like mine. Um, and these will be given to refugees resettling in the Bay Area. The College Corps has $146 million of state funding to start creating community and future success stories. M.G. Perez, KPBS News. Facing a wall of Republican opposition and key defections within its ranks, Senate Democrats are trying to push new voting rights protections through Congress. Chris Nguyen has more from Washington on why the effort is likely to fail. On Capitol Hill, the Senate began debate Tuesday on voting rights legislation that combines two separate bills already passed by the House. We have not reached the place where every person can vote easily and openly and honestly. The Freedom to Vote Act would establish nationwide standards for ballot access, including requiring states to allow early voting and vote by mail. It would also make Election Day a federal holiday. The second measure, named after the late Representative John Lewis, would restore parts of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that were weakened by the Supreme Court. Democratic Senators Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are against exempting voting rights legislation from the filibuster. And this is a fight. Voting rights is a fight. Republicans, when they show up, they show up with an ax. Democrats show up with a butter knife. Supporters say voting rights measures are needed to undercut laws passed by Republican-led states that make it harder for people of color to vote. Our future hinges on your decision, and history will remember what choice you make. But opponents are calling the proposal partisan overreach, with some saying that more attention should be placed on the Electoral Count Act. Let's have a bipartisan effort to clarify a law that's 150 years old rather than the efforts the Democrats are taking to politicize and uh, use January 6th as a political weapon. In Washington, Chris Wynn, KPBS News. There's an old saying that all politics is local, but increasingly the San Diego County Board of Supervisors and local city councils are holding votes on national issues. KPBS reporter Claire Tregesser explains how they reflect our intensely partisan times. In September last year, the county supervisors listened to almost three hours of public comment. The issue at hand, abortion rights. Supervisor Nora Vargas made the proposal. It's important that all San Diegans know that San Diego County is a champion for reproductive freedom. Let's be clear. The vote was one of several in recent times on national issues that don't have a direct impact on local governance of the county. In April, the supervisors voted to support state and federal gun control legislation. In November, to support a ban on offshore oil drilling. The motion passes with Supervisor Desmond voting no. All other supervisors who are present voting aye. Thank you. These are very much partisan issues, and the board's Democratic majority chose them for a reason. Usually, the two Republicans on the board, Jim Desmond and Joel Anderson, were either absent or voted no. The votes are likely done with an eye on future elections, says Thad Kauser, a politics professor at UC San Diego. That are designed to set up campaign mailers and TV ads in the next election. And, and, and part of the job as a politician is being able to, to take a stand and explain that stand to your constituents. Such tactics are nothing new. The Berkeley City Council once voted on nuclear disarmament and in support of human rights in Myanmar hardly issues a city government has any jurisdiction over. But they become increasingly common in San Diego County, not just at the Board of Supervisors, but local city councils too. 
Kauser says while these votes might be obvious political ploys, there are benefits to them. For one, they tend to increase engagement in local politics. What we often worry about is a democratic deficit where where county supervisors, local uh, city council members, school board members, People don't know who they are, don't know what positions they're taking, and don't know whether they reflect their values. He says problems only arise if the votes happen so often that they interfere with the other business of the board or council. Republican San Diego Councilman Chris Kate says that's exactly what has been happening. The council began taking votes on several national issues, from transgender bathrooms to sanctuary state laws. And I just said, I was not elected to do this. I don't have time to read and see all the debates of regarding Senate bills or court cases and the nuances of them all. And so I just took a really across the board position of I'm just not going to vote on them. Kate chafes at what he sees as petty politics and says the votes don't resonate in Washington, D.C., where something could actually be done about them. I don't think called us and said, Boy, the city of San Diego's letter on this issue really moved the day and moved the needle on this topic being debated in D.C. I mean, I, I've never gotten that phone call. But local leaders should take a stand on national issues because here and elsewhere, basic civil liberties like voting rights, LGBTQ rights, and reproductive rights are under attack. So says Will Rodriguez Kennedy, chairman of the San Diego County Democratic Party. It's important that people in, in Democratic states or just plain states that respect human and civil rights uh, do things to sort of counterbalance that na national narrative. He says holding these votes informs the public on the issues they care about. The public should know who's in power and what their ideology and their values are. And if their values do not match with their their own personal values, the values of, of families throughout San Diego, what they discuss at the kitchen table, then they should not elect them. Kate says that has not been his experience. That has never come up, has never been a priority for, for residents where if someone went out of their way to ask me, you know, what's your position on, on this federal issue uh, that I hear about on, you know, Fox News or, or MSNBC or anything else. It's never been that way at all. It's when are we going to fix my street? Why is my water bill so high? Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. The effects of climate change have significantly impacted the West as the region is drying out, creating catastrophic wildfires. The Biden administration is making plans to stave off those wildfires by thinning the forests in areas that are considered hot spots. The areas are typically at the cusp of where nature and residential neighborhoods meet. Officials want to reduce vegetation that fuel these fires by more than doubling controlled burns and logging operations. The plan is to focus on areas that have been devastated by wildfires fires, including California's Sierra Nevada mountains and Colorado's Rocky Mountain foothills. Last night's rainfall has prompted a general water advisory by the Department of Environmental Health and Quality to avoid water contact at all coastal areas. The DEHQ issued the advisory to remind swimmers and surfers about the higher bacteria levels in the water, especially near storm drains, creeks, rivers, and lagoons. The closure area ranges from the beaches at in the international border to 500 feet north of Carnation Avenue. Contact with the water should be avoided for 72 hours after a rain event. We're going to watch as our winds turn more offshore over the next couple of days, which means temperatures are going to be on the rise and we're all going to stay mainly dry ahead too. We had again a little bit of some sprinkles out there yesterday, maybe even earlier this morning, but for the most part over the next couple of days, we'll see more in the way of sunshine and again, the warmer temperatures too. Looking ahead to tonight, we get back down to about 50 degrees for you in Oceanside, mid 40s in Ramona, same thing out towards Brago Springs, Mount Laguna, still getting down into the 30s for those overnight lows. Wednesday, same old story, looking to stay tranquil, looking to stay mild, and temperatures are actually going to be a good bit above average over the next couple of days, especially as we head towards the later part of the work week. Temperatures getting up into the mid-60s for you out towards San Diego. El Cajon, 66 for your daytime high on Wednesday, 74 in Borrego Springs. That sounds pretty nice. 47 for you in Mount Laguna. And not really much of a change here Thursday. Really, the entire western half of the country, for the most part, is looking to 
stay pretty quiet over the next several days and especially as we head into the weekend. Near the coast, temperatures over the next couple of days going from the low 60s on Wednesday into the low 70s on Thursday. Could see a brief drop into the 60s there for you Friday, but looking to stay nice and mild through the weekend. Low to mid 70s for you both Saturday and Sunday. Further inland, temperatures following the same trend going from the mid 60s into the mid 70s on Thursday. And then Friday, Saturday, Sunday will hold nice and steady in the low to mid 70s with plenty of sunshine on the board. In the mountains, temperatures going from the upper 40s into the low 50s Thursday, Friday. Could see a little bit of a drop off here, though, with some breezy winds and temperatures getting back into the 40s for you Saturday and Sunday. And in the deserts, temperatures really not changing much here from day to day. Looking to stay nice and steady in the low to mid 70s with a good amount of sunshine and again, no rain in the forecast. For KPBS News, I'm meteorologist Jessica Pash. This week, new measures are being put in place to make it easier for Americans to get a COVID-19 test. Mandy Gaither has more on what you need to know. New COVID-19 cases still high, hospitals still struggling, and when it comes to COVID-19 tests, an unprecedented demand. That's why we've had to take additional measures. We have a billion tests that will become available to people that they can order through the website. That website, covidtests.gov, launched Tuesday. Initially, there will be a limit of four tests per household. They're expected to be shipped within 7 to 12 days of being ordered. There are no shipping costs. Most Americans with private insurance can also now buy home tests online or in stores. Contact your insurer to find out if they provide direct coverage at the time of purchase or if claims must be submitted. Make sure to keep your receipt in case it's needed. Other things to know, you won't need a doctor's order or prescription to get the free tests. Insurers must pay for up to eight tests per covered person a month. As for any tests bought before January 15th, you won't be able to get reimbursed. If you're on Medicare, COVID-19 testing done in a lab when ordered by a medical professional comes at no charge. Those enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans should check with insurers to see if at-home test costs will be covered. <gasps> Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program cover home tests with no cost sharing, but enrollees should contact their state agencies for specific coverage details. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. And you can find that link to order free COVID tests on our website, kpbs.org. And we are following all of the latest developments at tracking COVID-19. You'll find that under the News tab right there on our homepage. The San Diego County Board of Supervisors recently voted to allow micro-enterprise home kitchens. KPBS Speak City Heights reporter Jacob Ayer says the law could officially change by late February, but some local home kitchen owners have already been shut down. Just south of the 94 freeway in San Diego's Emerald Hills neighborhood is where Rosalind Johnson lives. Originally from St. Louis, Missouri, Johnson loves to cook soul food staples from her hometown. During the early days of the pandemic, she decided to share her passion with the community after she got laid off from her job. She opened Clara's Kitchen from her home and even helped serve seniors during the COVID-19 pandemic. That was until she got a cease and desist letter from the County of San Diego just less than a year ago. I did some research, research actually, and I found out that it was okay for you to do it, I thought. I got my business license, I got my food certification, got my seller's permit. I thought that I was ready to go and to find out I wasn't. <laughs> In Paradise Hills, there's a slightly different story for Delilah Davis in her SoCal Cafe delivery business. She's been cooking and selling food from her home for seven years to a select few trusted customers with minimal online advertising. That's because it's still illegal to run a micro-enterprise home kitchen, also known as a Miko, in San Diego County, even though the state allowed for their introduction in 2018. And so in further research of finding out that Riverside County had actually approved it and they had several businesses operating successfully under the bill. I was ready literally to sell my house um, this year. I was gonna sell my home and find another home in Riverside County, just so I could go up there and be part of that. Davis and Johnson both want Mikos to be held to the same health and safety standards as traditional restaurants and food trucks, but acknowledge there may be some challenges at the beginning. 
They both say that home enterprise kitchens have a lot more benefits than drawbacks, particularly in disadvantaged communities. That's because of the lower startup costs. So this is like the perfect opportunity for me to be able to go into business, generate cash flow in order to establish a business. The second ordinance reading to allow the micro enterprise home kitchens in San Diego County will come during the board's land use meeting on January 26th. If the board then votes in favor, Mikos will be allowed to operate 30 days after that for at least the next two years in the county. Jake Bear, KPBS News. And here is another look at today's top stories. Trash started being picked up again today in Chula Vista and other communities served by Republic Services after a month-long strike. The city of Chula Vista plans to fine the company and ask it to pay back the money the city shelled out to keep from drowning in trash. Officials also want customers to be reimbursed for the month that they went without services. And today, the telecom industry agreed to limit their rollout of 5G technology. The wireless spectrum is very close to the radar that airplanes use to land in low visibility conditions. The airline industry has said the 5G towers cannot operate within two miles of an airfield. An FAA list of airports that have adequate buffer zones does not include the San Diego International Airport. The San Diego Zoo is celebrating the birth of a Sumatran orangutan, a critically endangered species. The zoo announced today that the healthy male was born on January 4th and released this adorable picture of him. He has been named Kaja after an island in the Indonesian part of Borneo that houses rehabilitated orangutans. It's the first orangutan birth at the zoo since 2014. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Maya Trabulsi. I hope you have a great evening. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you.